Good evening and welcome. Bonsoir et bienvenue. My name is Harvey Slack and I am an Ottawa Public Library Board Trustee member. And it is a great pleasure to be with you for this event. Kwai Kakina. It is important to acknowledge that even as we gather virtually, we are on the unceded territorial of the Anoshni Algonquin people. We honor the contributions of all First Nations, Inuit and Metis, their elders and their ancestors, as we recognize their important contribution, past and present. We want to thank our partner in organizing this event, the Ottawa International Writers Festival. Tonight, we welcome Seth Klein to discuss his new book, A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. The Ottawa Public Library prides itself on informing the public and contributing to important conversations on timely and crucial topics such as climate change, perhaps the ultimate challenge of our times. This is yet another example of how books can help shape public discourse on key issues and help each of us participate fully in society. I look forward to tonight's conversation to learn more about how we can align our politics and economy with what the science says we must do to address the climate crisis. For another conversation on the subject, you can watch the recording of last week's conversation with Michael E. Mann on his book, The New Climate War, The Fight to Take Back Our Planet, available anytime on the Ottawa Public Library's Facebook page and no Facebook account is needed. You can also visit the Ottawa Public Library website anytime to find out about other inspiring programs and to assess a wide range of library tools and resources and services online. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Mr. Sean Wilson from the Ottawa International Writers Festival to say a few words. Thank you and have a great evening. Merci et bonne soirée. And over to you, Sean. Thank you, Harvey. Good evening, everyone. I am also broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. And I'm thrilled to welcome you all to the Writers' Festival's 2021 virtual season and to thank our friends at the Ottawa Public Library for their ongoing collaboration. I also want to thank you for supporting authors and booksellers through these difficult times. Our official bookseller is Perfect Books on Elgin Street. But I know that wherever you are right now, there's an independent bookseller nearby who would be more than happy to sell you some great books. Our spring season continues into June, and it's all available online, free and on demand at writersfestival.org. And next week, uh, our live event is Erica Eiffel with uh, Nora Loretto talking about her book, Take Back the Fight, Organizing Feminism for the Digital Age. So there's lots to look forward to. If you enjoy this event or any of our virtual programming, please consider making a charitable donation. Your financial support is crucial and allows us to continue to bring you the world's most interesting authors and thinkers. Tonight, we're turning our attention to the climate emergency and I'm thrilled to introduce our host. Dimitri Lascaris is a lawyer, journalist and activist. As a lawyer, he led Canada's largest and most accomplished team of securities class action lawyers at Siskins, where his team recovered more than $450 million for aggrieved investors, he retired in 2016 in order to devote himself to journalism, activism, and pro bono legal work. In 2016, Dimitri ran for the Green Party of Canada in the riding of London West, went on to serve as the party's justice critic, and also as justice critic in the shadow cabinet of the Green Party of Quebec. 2018, he was elected to be a member of the uh, Green Party of Quebec's uh, executive committee. Last year, he threw his hat into the leadership contest for the Green Party of Canada, where he finished in second place out of eight candidates, garnering 45.5% of the vote uh, in the last ballot. I'm so glad he's with us tonight to lead the conversation with Seth Klein on the climate war. Please join me in a warm virtual welcome to our host this evening, Dimitri Lascaris. Dimitri. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here this evening, a privilege to talk uh, with Seth Klein about his outstanding new book. Uh, which I'll have uh, more to say about in a moment. First, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the unceded territory, the Ganyanyahaga people in what is now old Montreal. They are the true custodians of this land on which I am now privileged to live and work. Um, the book we're going to be talking about this evening, 
an outstanding work, I assure you. It's called A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. And just to give you a, a flavor of the rave reviews that it's received on the cover, there's a quote from Bill McKibben. This is a truly great book. Few people have thought as deeply or with as much precision about the climate crisis as Seth Klein. Seth, the author of this wonderful book, served for 22 years as the founding director of the British Columbia Office of the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, Canada's foremost uh, social justice think tank, and a think tank of which I'm a huge fan. Uh, he is now a freelance policy consultant, speaker, researcher, and writer, and author of this book. As I mentioned, he's an adjunct professor with Simon Fraser's University's uh, Urban Studies Program, and he remains a research associate with the CCPA's BC office. Uh, I've often said that those of us, uh, Seth, who advocate for radical scientifically based action to address the climate crisis are not extremists as we are often painted out to be by uh, advocates for the fossil fuels industry. Rather, the true extremists are the guardians of a suicidal status quo. And according to my definition of extremism, Seth Klein is the consummate moderate because he recognizes the enormity of what is at stake and that transformational changes are absolutely vital. Uh, moreover, he eloquently advocates for profound but scientifically based measures to resolve what is an existential emergency to all of our species. And to my mind, that is the quintessence of moderation. So it's a true pleasure uh, to be here with you tonight, Seth. Uh, I'd like to start by asking you the big picture question. Uh, as someone who comes from the peace movement, mm -hmm. what prompted you to write a book uh, calling for a wartime mobilization to resolve the climate emergency? Hi, good evening, Demetrius. First of all, it's really nice to be doing this with you. I, I've heard lots about you and followed you, but this is the first time we're meeting. And I should say that I'm joining you from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, uh, otherwise known as Vancouver. So let me just jump right into your, your question. Um, yeah, if you had said to uh, people who knew me back in the day when I was a teenage peace activist uh, that I had written a war story, they, they'd be mightily surprised. Um, I, I didn't plan on writing a war story. When, when, I, when I actually set out to write the book, um, I wanted to write a book that would tackle what do we do about this harrowing gap between what the science says we have to do and what our politics seems prepared to entertain. In the original book outline, there was only one chapter that was going to be about lessons from the Second World War, because I'd long been intrigued by the war as an example of rapid economic transformation. I thought maybe there were some useful lessons that could be drawn from that. But as I delved into that research, I started to see more and more parallels and not just on the economic front, but in a whole host of areas. And you know, because this is a writer's festival, I should say as well that uh, you know, when I set out to write a book, you know, I'd spent 22 years writing policy reports. And when I set out to write a book, I, I went and you know, I had chats with friends who were actual writers and they all had the same advice. You gotta, you gotta have narrative, you gotta have story. And as I delved into that, of course, I saw so much story uh, to weave into it, ended up rewriting the whole outline structure around lessons from the Second World War. It, give, it gave a useful structure. It, I, think, I think the analogy is apt. They're both existential threats. It also, Dimitri, jolt, even though I've dealt with this material for years, it jolted my own thinking about emergencies um, and, and sort of allowed me to look at what we need to do with fresh eyes. And, and I, you know, I'm sure we'll get to that, but I, I found a lot of hope in that too. So a, a central theme of your book, it's something I, I also talk about a lot in the course of discussing the climate crisis, is uh, something you term the new climate change denialism. Uh, could you tell us what you mean by that term and how it manifests itself in our society today? Mm -hmm. So I think the new climate denialism is the, the main thing we're up against, actually. Uh, so what do I mean by that? So I, I distinguish that from the, the old school denialism, which is just denying the science, right? The, the reality of human induced climate change a la Maxime Bernier or Donald Trump. Um, the good news is that when you look at the opinion polling, uh, that those who, who hold those views are a diminishing rump of public opinion. I, I'm actually not that concerned about them. Um, far more widespread and insidious um, is what I call the new climate denialism. And what I mean by that is leaders in government, in industry, in some extent, to some extent in all of us, uh, who, uh, who say they get it, 
and accept the reality of the science and yet continue to practice a policy agenda that does not align with what the science says we have to do. And the new climate denialism is how I would characterize our federal government. It's how I would characterize basically every provincial government we have in one form or another, which is you know, to pay lip service to getting the science and yet doubling down on fossil fuel extraction and um, presenting plans that uh, where, where the math just can't align with what we have to do. You mentioned, uh, Seth, a, a poll, a recent poll, and in your book you talk about this at some length. I didn't know about this poll until I read your book, and it, uh, it really got me fired up because I didn't realize the level of support and concern out there in Canada. It was an abacus poll, which I believe you commissioned in 2019. Could you tell us uh, what are the main takeaways from that poll? Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, so I did commission it uh, as part of the research for the book. And I should say the reason I commissioned it, I, re I commissioned it for a couple of reasons. First, I was interviewing many politicians for the book and political insiders. And I wasn't interested, to, to your previous question, I wasn't interested in interviewing politicians who don't, you know, who are, who are outright deniers. I only wanted to interview people who I actually think genuinely get it and yet whose governments or parties uh, practice the new climate denialism. And I wanted to know why. And when you press them on that, in one form or another, they all fall back on some variant of the rejoinder, well, you got to meet the public where they're at and the public's not there yet. Now, I found that a very frustrating answer, uh, in part because I was just in the middle of studying all this World War II stuff, where one of the remarkable things about the leaders we remember there is that they didn't meet the public where they were at. They took the public where they needed to go. Um, and yet, I also wanted to test the presumption it was also my observation that almost all the polling that we've seen and, and thousands of dollars have been spent on it, including by many environmental groups and so on, asked incremental questions that were no longer relevant. Um, you know, we're finding a great deal of information about uh, irrelevant information. Um, and I wanted to test emergency. So to answer your question, uh, the big takeaway was that I actually found the politicians hadn't given the public enough credit. I found a public that was ahead of our politics when it comes to both understanding that this is an emergency and their willingness to uh, accept truly bold policies. And by bold, I mean well beyond what any federal or provincial government currently has on offer. And that's good news. And that was true. Interestingly, you know, the, the, the support for bold action ranges from a high in your province in Quebec to, as you might expect, a low in Alberta, but even in Alberta, it's pretty strong, uh, you know, and, and leads to me saying, you know, we, we shouldn't let uh, Jason Kenney define the political culture of Alberta. It's a lot more complicated than that. You know, it, it, this disconnect between public opinion uh, and uh, political action, uh, I think was on dramatic display today, Seth, when uh, the Liberal government put out a budget I'm going to depart for a moment from the climate crisis and talk about inequality, which is something we're going to come to later in our discussion, the link between inequality, inequality and the climate crisis. Uh, but there's no wealth tax in this massive document. Nowhere in it is there a wealth tax, even though since March of last year, Canada's billionaires have seen collectively their net worth soar by $78 billion, a truly obscene sum to have earned passively in a pandemic in an unprecedented uh, uh, economic and public health emergency. And public support, according to a recent poll for a wealth tax is sky high. 80% of Canadians support a wealth tax. 84% of liberals, people who identify as liberal party supporters support a wealth tax. Even uh, nearly two thirds of conservative party supporters support a wealth tax. Both the conservatives and the liberals uh, voted against a non-binding motion in favor of wealth tax in November of last year. I know this is a big topic, but it's one that I think we really, uh, those of us who are active in the climate movement, we really have to get a handle on it, understand it and deal with it effectively. What accounts for this constant disconnect you see between the actions or inaction of the political class and public opinion? Well, first of all, uh, the lack of a wealth tax in today's budget is indeed uh, it's, it's, it's flabbergasting, actually, given, by the way, the, the statistic you just cited about the increase in the 
wealth of Canada's billionaires was was from my old shop at the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, and I'm grateful for the work that they do. Um, and I want to bring this actually back to my book, um, because what's interesting when you look at the kind of wealth accumulation and really rampant profiteering that has occurred in this pandemic. That was illegal in the Second World War. Um, in the Second World War, uh, we saw the corporate income tax rate increase from uh, 18 to, to 40 percent, but that's not all. We also had an excess profits tax. The way it worked actually is they, they went back to the four years before the war, uh, looked at the average profit rate in every industry, and then they said to every business, large and small across the land, that's your annual limit until the war is over. Meaning once you hit that profit level, the top marginal tax rate was 100%. Now, why does that matter? And I'm gonna bring this back to climate. Um, it matters because when you are asking the public to engage in a grand undertaking together, whether it's the climate emergency or war or pandemic, you need social solidarity. You need to know that everyone's in. In the first world war, inequality and rampant profiteering had undermined that social solidarity. It had actually undermined recruitment efforts, partly why we had a conscription crisis. Mackenzie King was very aware of this at the beginning of the second world war, which is why he brought in the excess profits tax in order to maintain that social solidarity. And it, and it actually worked pretty well, but uh, we haven't got it now. Um, I mean, I, you asked why. Um, you know, because these parties uh, uh, in the end um, come from a particular uh, base and class that doesn't want uh, to, to see a wealth tax. Um, and they just ha simply haven't been able to turn their head around uh, that idea. And they're going to need to uh, if we're going to have the social solidarity that we're going to need to tackle the crises going forward. And you talk also about the role of the media. Uh, in uh, deterring the political class from acting, in engendering in the population a sense of futility uh, or fear, uh, fear of tra transformational change. What are your thoughts? I, I, what are your thoughts about how we can reform the institution of the media in this country? What we ought to do with the institution of the media in this country, in order to make it more responsible, in terms of giving the public the the, the vital information that they need in order to make informed decisions with respect to the climate crisis, inequality, uh, public health, and so forth? Well, let me, let me rephrase that slightly. So the media today is, is dominated by the same uh, new climate denialism as our politics, um, which is the media say they get the climate and yet they don't get the climate. Um, but part of what I'm trying to tackle in the book is to say, whether it's the media or political leaders or, or business leaders, you never know what the, at what point, under what circumstances, people actually become the leaders that we need them to be. Um, and this is partly what I find so inspiring about the World War II stuff that I excavated for the book. Um, uh, you know, uh, if, if you had said to Canadians in 1938, you know, this gang and Mackenzie King's cabinet, do they have what it takes to completely transform Canadian society and economy? I'm sure most of them would have said no. And they had no reason to believe otherwise. And they would have been wrong. If you had said to, to me a year and a bit ago, are there people at Finance Canada and the Bank of Canada who are capable of quickly pivoting and creating these audacious programs like the CERB and the wage subsidy? I would have said no. I would have said there's no one home who thinks that way and I would have been wrong. Um, and even look at the media, the, the contrast in the role of media between the, the, the poor way they have risen to the climate challenge. And I, I would say actually, have done a pretty good job on balance on the pandemic, right? The, in the, you know, in climate, they say, oh, well, we have to give equal time to the sides. It's complicated. They don't do that with COVID. They don't give equal sides to, to the people who question the science. Um, you know, they, 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 when, when we all had to isolate at home, they repurpose their kitchen tables. They inform us every day. They try to listen to the scientists. They've actually modeled what true science-based emergency communication should be. Similarly, in the war, um, the CBC had just been created three years before the war. 
and they were instrumental in bringing the Canadian public on board. The, the, even in the private sector media in the US, the team at CBS News led by Edward R. Murrow is credited with bringing about a 20 percentage point shift in US public opinion before Pearl Harbor around entry into the war. Because when people recognize an emergency for what it is and are truly invited to rise to the moment and become the people that we need them to be, sometimes they do it. The, 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 the awkward period in which we find ourselves is that so far they haven't found their mojo on climate. And, and by the way, I don't wanna uh, paint all the media with one brush. As you point out quite rightly in your book, there are small media organizations in this country that are doing fantastic uh, journalism with respect to the climate crisis and other issues of profound importance to Canadians. Organizations like, uh, media organizations like the Tai Ricochet, uh, uh, Rabble, Observer. National Observer is doing great work. Uh, and there's a new media organization coming online called The Breach, yes. uh, one of whose uh, journalists will be your brother-in-law, Avi Lewis. Yeah. Uh, and I think uh, that is an organization, all of them are media organizations that we as Canadians have to support. You suggest in your book, I think uh, it's, a, it's a great suggestion that the government uh, should make uh, contributions to these media organizations uh, tax deductible yes. because they are uh, you know, so critically dependent upon the support of their audience rather than on uh, advertisers uh, or large corporations financing their operations. They seem to be moving on that slowly. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a monthly supporter of m all of the ones you just mentioned. And, and, and I would add to that the Narwhal, which now can issue tax receipts. And I, I don't know what's happening with some of those others, but I hope they get that as well. But I want to come back to another thing that I've been calling for, particularly around the role of the CBC as our our public broadcaster. Um, as I said before, in the war, uh, it was key. Uh, and the newsreader at the time, by the way, in the war was Lauren Green, you know, I mean, we, you, we're probably around the same age. I don't know. Are you a child of the 70s like me? 63. Oh, you're 63. Okay. I'm a little, I'm a little younger than you. Anyway, I, I remember Lauren Green as the original commander of Dama and the original Battlestar Galactica. Me but, too. <laughs> but, but before he went to Hollywood, he was known to Canadians affectionately during the war as the voice of doom. Every night, people gathered around the radio and got the latest on how the battle was unfolding from him and with his incredible voice. Um, you know, and for me, as I excavate this stuff, I keep asking, what does that look like today? And why is it that, you know, on our morning CBC radio shows, we can have hourly business and sports reports, but not a morning climate emergency report? telling us how this battle for our lives is unfolding at home and abroad every day, the good and the bad, both the challenges, both those who are, who are the collaborators seeking to block progress, but also the millions of other good people around the world who are with us uh, uh, you know, in this task of our lives. So we should have that every morning. Yeah. And, and one of the things that, uh, that I, uh, was quite enlightening for me about your book, I, I was, I was expecting to read a book about the climate emergency and it ended up being so much more than that. I, I learned a great deal about uh, Canada's involvement in the Second World War that was not known to me previously. So one strike, yeah, it, and, and it, that, that in and of itself, I think is, is, is uh, uh, something uh, tremendous, tr tremendously valuable about your, your book is that it raises consciousness about things we should be aware of, but that have been buried in the, you know, in the annals of time. And one striking fact uh, for me was that, I didn't know this, that when Canada declared war on Germany, uh, there was quite a bit of opposition, opposition in Canada, particularly in Quebec, uh, to the war. There certainly wasn't a great deal of enthusiasm, uh, but the government, uh, through a variety of measures, and I'd like you to talk about the, uh, those, not just the media, but the government itself, managed to bring the public consciousness in line with the government policy, which was the right policy. We had to go to war against the Nazi threat. That was you know, one of the few instances in history of a just war, it was the right mm -hmm. decision. Talk to us about how the government, the types of ta techniques the government used to uh, bring, a, bring along public opinion and get the necessary level of support and enthusiasm for this massive and dangerous initiative. Yeah, well, this is such an important point. And, and I think, it's also one from which I derive some solace when it comes to the climate emergency, because most of us assume 
you know, with what little history we know that, you know, we declare war in September of 1939 and everyone's on board and ready to rally. And as you say, um, it turns out that's not true. Um, at best, people were kind of reluctantly prepared to go along with it, but there was lots of opposition. The very question, even when we declared war, the question of whether or not we would send troops overseas remained an open question, as opposed to just sort of defend our own borders. Um, and, you know, so I, I became quite interested in the question, and same is true in the pandemic and, and climate. What's the alchemy of these moments? What's the combination of events and leadership that shifts the zeitgeist and brings the public on board to the emergency? Historians refer to the first nine months of the Second World War as the phony war because we declared war, but then not a lot happened initially. And, and as, I, as, as I say, the public were reluctant. You know, it was a, Jack Granitstein, a historian, de describes it as, as a, a state of half hearted unity. Um, uh, but then there was the fall of France nine months later. That was an event that shifts the zeitgeist. But as you are asking about, it also took leadership on the part of the government. Um, it took ubiquitous advertising, the, the, the marshalling of the arts, not just the media, but, you know, sending artists to the front, uh, uh, the posters, the, the and NFB had also, the National Film Board had also just been created and starts pumping out all of these documentaries. Um, uh, so all of that was part of it. But here was another piece of it. And it, it was really a shift that starts to happen as of about 1942. In the early years, we, it wasn't yet a cross society mobilization. And it wasn't, we weren't hitting the recruitment numbers that we needed to hit. You know, all the propaganda that said, you know, go get Hitler and all that. Um, it worked to a point, but only to a point. Because in fact, you know, when I told people about the book I was writing, often people would say, oh, well, everyone understood the threat to be clear and present in the war. Not true. The threat was not clear and present in Canada, it was on the other side of two oceans. Um, but, so what the government realized as of about 42 is that if they were actually going to get the mobilization they needed and the recruitment numbers they needed to hit, they had to engage Canadians in a conversation about the kind of society they would come back to. Um, you actually saw that Canada's first major income support programs come in during the war. Uh, unemployment insurance, 1940. The Family Allowance, 1944. The Marsh Commission, the, the, the report that would lay the foundation for the whole post-war welfare state is written during the war and offered up to Canadians as a pledge and a promise that the society they would come back to would look different and more just than the one they were leaving behind. That's when they get the cross-society mobilization. That's when they hit the recruitment numbers that they're looking for. And to me, that has a, an echo today in the appeal of the Green New Deal, that when you link uh, fighting on climate with tackling income inequality and, and social justice issues, that's actually when you get everyone on the bus. Um, and uh, I, think, I think that's the key lesson. And that's the one, you know, to your earlier question about a wealth tax that has not yet registered with our leaders that they actually have to combine these things in that way if, if we're actually gonna pull off what we need to pull off. I, I wanna uh, come, up, come back to inequality uh, a little bit later. It's such an important point, but before we leave this question about, you know, um, it, uh, about generating the necessary public support for the profound challenges ahead, uh, you quoted someone in the book, the name now escapes me, uh, said climate crisis needs a few things. One of the things it needs is poets. Yeah, uh, which I thought was a really beautiful comment. It was uh, Alex. It was Alex Himmel, uh, Himmelfarb who right. who used to be right. the clerk of the Privy Council. Yeah. So, so tell us about the role you think the artistic community has to play in uh, dealing with this crisis. Well, I think the arts play a key role in any mobilization. Um, you know, whether it's for a war or the kind of challenge that we face today. And as I was alluding to before, I think they played a huge role in the Second World War. Um, same in other countries, same in the United States. In the United States, you know, we never had a new deal in Canada like they did in the States. In the States, the arts component of the new deal had been massive, right? So they went into the war having just kind of created this incredible infrastructure for, 
for theater and sculpture and uh, visual arts and and poets and all you know who 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 could then help to rally a public uh, for for the next fight. Um, so I think that matters. But I also I mean a couple points on that. One is, you know, when you, what's interesting when you look at the arts of the World War II era. Let me take a step back. If you look at most of the early, you know, we're getting some arts producing climate stuff now, which is good. It's almost all dystopian, which is understandable to a point, right? Because it's, it's scary. But it's interesting to me that most of the arts from the Second World War isn't dystopian, even though this, the context was horrific. Um, it's rallying us. The tone is rallying us. And so my, the book has a bit of a challenge to artists, which is, A, we need climate emergency art, and we need it to make uh, hope convincing as much as... Uh... The other thing I would say about messaging generally is it needs to be consistent. And, and this is one of my main critiques of our federal government and so many of our provincial governments, which is um, the climate, there's nothing about what we're hearing now that looks and sounds and feels like an emergency not ubiquitous enough, and it's confusing, right? To, to, to say, as the Trudeau government has, to declare a climate emergency motion in the House of Commons one day and reapprove the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion the very next day is confusing. Or even the fact that we continue to allow advertising by fossil fuel vehicles and gas stations. Is it an emergency or is it not an emergency? Because if it's an emergency, that's confusing and it should be banned, just like we do with tobacco. Yeah, and not only do they allow, <laughs> one thing I'm struck, struck by when I see these ubiquitous advertisements for gas guzzling vehicles is you almost always see the vehicle in some beautiful natural setting. Yeah. You never see them where they spend most of their time, which is clogged in urban traffic, yeah. you know, with some uh, person at the wheel ready to pull his or her and hair And it out. particularly targets young people. This yeah. is like with cigarette, historically with cigarettes, right? And it's function as much as trying to sell a particular you know, make and model of a vehicle is ideological. It's, it's, it's convincing people that this is what they should desire. And mm -hmm. the hour is too late for that. And, and from, I must tell you that from a legal perspective, something that uh, troubles me greatly is the absence of enforcement in this country uh, of truth and advertising laws. So a lot of these, uh, right across the board, actually, it's not just with respect to, for example, uh, combustion engine vehicles or uh, other, other activities or products that are harmful to the environment, but misleading advertising is the rule rather than the exception in this country. And we have laws on the books, uh, particularly at the federal government level, we have the Competition Act, but no one is actually enforcing uh, the law as against advertisers and the major corporations that are leading the public astray and constantly uh, inculcating them in, in them a belief that they need to buy things that are actually harmful to them or to the planet upon which they depend. Uh, so I, as a lawyer, I have to say, <laughs> take the opportunity talking to you here tonight. Well, you should this, go get them. Yeah, this is- um, what... and, and I think when this speaks to the fact that, you know, if, when we have a government that truly gets that this is an emergency, um, it isn't just about, uh, you know, the, you know, what we, the funding we provide for infra climate infrastructure and so on. What is the role of the CRTC as the regulator? What is the role of the Canada Council as a funder of the arts? Uh, what is the role of the CBC and the NFB? What, um, and, and I actually think, like we in the war, we had a wartime information board that actually helped to coordinate all of this and get the public on board. I think we need a climate emergency information board again, because um, here's the thing to come back to one of your first questions. The opinion polling I found was very hopeful, but I want to give a caveat. The, the opinion polling in Canada reveals a public that is confused. So you get like 25% of the public who are like us, climate alarmed, ready for big action. You get almost half the public who are confused in the middle. They, they, know, they know it's serious. They're wor increasingly worried. They believe the government should be do, doing something, but the basic level of climate literacy is appalling. Half of the public doesn't even know that the leading source of global warming is the combusting of fossil fuels. Um, uh, so they don't know what causes climate change. They don't know what to do about it. And so 
if you're the federal government, you can make real mischief with these people because it's super easy to give them the impression that you're doing something when you're not. Mm -hmm. well, and on that point, one thing about that poll that uh, st stood out for me, I may have the number wrong, Seth, but I believe that the percentage of respondents who were aware of the Green New Deal, who had heard about it before, was in the range of 14 percent or something. Very low, yeah. And, and uh, for me, somebody who talks about the Green New Deal on an almost daily basis, I, I, I found that astonishing. And then but the good news yeah, there. Yeah, it, you, you did were about something very clever. You actually explained in a very pithy way in the poll what the Green New Deal is, highlighting the fact that it includes support uh, for workers in the transition, income support. Uh, you know, nobody's going to be left behind. And talk to us about how people responded once they uh, understood, at least uh, at a basic level, what the Green New Deal was all about. Yeah. So when I gave this very short definition of the Green New Deal, link that it's you know tackling the twin crises of our time climate and inequality and including you know, this bold infrastructure spending people loved it uh, i believe the number was 72 percent of the public were like sign me up sounds good which is way more support than any political party has right um and even in alberta 50 percent of the people were like sounds good to me um so uh, this is another key takeaway from the polling is that, and it's why I say that, you know, unlike a lot of climate policy people who are like, oh, don't link the climate fight to inequality, you know, don't make it any more complicated. It's hard enough as it is. This is why I think they're wrong. What the polling shows is that uh, when you link bold climate action to tackling inequality, increasing transfers to low-income people, increasing taxes on the wealthy and corporations, good jobs guarantee for fossil fuel workers. Support for the bold climate action doesn't go down. It goes through the roof. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's what we got to do. So uh, on a uh, related but distinct theme, uh, you describe your book at the outset as a hopeful book. And indeed, I found it to be very hopeful. The last book I read, I, I literally just finished reading it before I began reading yours, was The Uninhabitable Earth. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I actually- That's important to read too. Absolutely. I actually devoured that book. Uh, usually it takes me a long time to get through books because I get distracted by other books. Uh, but that one I couldn't put down. And it was uh, quite frightening. Um, and it went against the grain of sort of conventional thinking. And you talk about this in your book about how- uh, we can effectively uh, convey to the public the urgency of the situation and get them on board with the transition that we need. Uh, and you, you acknowledge that there are a lot of people out there who say that alarmism, uh, negativism, fear mongering is not effective as a communication strategy. And you take issue with that. Yes. Uh, could you I tell think us? It's a false choice. Right. Um, well, I think in all things and in all great undertakings, we are motivated by a combination of fear and hope and love. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's this age old debate, uh, you know, uh, you don't want to scare people for, for decades, the, the climate movement, I, I, I had to say it has, has held to a view that don't talk about crisis, don't talk about emergency, um, because it's too scary. And I think they're wrong. Uh, they've been wrong. I think it's people are shifting. Uh, that's the good news and the public itself, the terrain of public opinion with extreme weather events is shifting. Um, so I think we should do both. By the way, I see people in the chat sharing some wonderful quotes on this whole uh, idea of inspiration to uh, thank you, Lynn, about the Syracuse cultural workers. Um, uh, my takeaway from the study of World War II is there are these four markers that I use now of when you know that a government gets an emergency. They are, it spends what it takes to win, they create new economic institutions to get the job done. They move from voluntary to mandatory measures as needed. And they tell the truth. Now, I actually think, you know, obviously we did all of those things in the war. You know, to greater or lesser degrees, our, our government has done all of those things in the pandemic and none of those things with respect to climate. And on that last one, to tell the truth and to your, to your point, Dimitri, the leaders we most remember from the Second World War were these remarkable communicators and, and who were forthright with the public about the severity of the crisis and yet still managed to impart hope, right? That's the fine line we're trying to walk here. 
we're not trying to be Pollyanna about the severity of the crisis. We have to be upfront and straight with people and, get, and, and, and give them credit to be able to realize what we're up against and yet still manage to impart hope. And that's you know, the balance I'm trying to strike in the book. So let's talk about the future and you, as you envision it. Uh, and after this, I'd like to give people in the audience, I'm sure there are many people uh, anxious to ask questions. I don't want to dominate. By the way, and, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw into the chat there uh, a link to my book. And I'm going to throw in as well a link, which I just did, a link to um, these four markers that, I'm, that I just mentioned. Sorry, go, uh, go ahead. So uh, you, you argue uh, in the latter half of your book about a dramatic restru restructuring of the Canadian economy, and you identify eight core elements of this economic transformation. Could you talk to us about these, these core elements? Well, uh, I, I mean, the easiest way to think about it is the, uh, those first three markers that I just mentioned. Um, so first of all, we need to spend what it takes. Um, and we haven't been doing that and today's budget doesn't either. Today's budget seems to boost spending by something like uh, 2 billion a year on climate. Um, we should be spending about 2% of GDP on climate mitigation. Uh, 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 and that in the Canadian context would be about $50 billion. Uh, that's what we should be spending if we were spending what it takes to win. Um, uh, but the other piece of it is create new economic uh, institutions to get the job done. So let me take a step back and offer a bit of that World War II history. Um, it was remarkable what happened on the home front in the Second World War in terms of from a base of almost nothing, right? We produced seven, about 700 ships, 16,000 military aircraft, ultimately producing the fourth largest air force in the world, 800,000 military vehicles, more than Germany, Italy, and Japan combined, all from a base of virtually nothing. In order to do that, the, the minister in the King government who oversaw all of this was this guy, C.D. Howe, who, you know, <laughs> I'm sure you and I, we both think of the think tank named for the guy. And, and to be clear, he was no lefty, right? He's on the right wing of the of the Mackenzie King government, but he was seized with the task. And anytime the private sector couldn't quickly do what needed doing, he created another crown corporation to get the job done. He created 28 crown corporations in the course of the war. Remarkable, eh? The Trudeau government's created two crown corporations, the Canada Infrastructure Bank, which is basically a vehicle for privatizing infrastructure. And the other one is the Trans Mountain Pipeline Corporation. Um, uh, so C.D. Howe created 28 of these things, but he didn't just create, and, and why does Crown Corp, why, why does the creation of these institutions matter? Because if you're not creating them, the best you can do is try to incentivize somebody else to build and manufacture what we need. Look at this pandemic, right? What, what did the Trudeau government not do at the beginning? They didn't bring back a Crown Corporation to mass manufacture vaccines. So we could, we're entirely dependent on, on, on the goodwill of others uh, to, for imports. In today's budget, all of the manufacturing targets that the government wants to hit for the creation of solar panels and wind turbines and, and bu electric buses and heat pumps and all the things we need to decarbonize our economy, you know what they're gonna do? They're having the corporate income tax rate for them, trying to incentivize somebody else to do what needs doing instead of just creating the institutions to get the job done ourselves. So that's the key. The other thing that C.D. Howe was doing is actually um, coordinating all the supply chains. So all of the key inputs in order is being, are being carefully coordinated in order to uh, prioritize the production that actually needed to happen. I think we need to do the same thing on climate. We need to say how many wind turbines and solar panels and electric buses and heat pumps and et cetera, we're gonna to need to electrify everything and decarbonize and, uh, and then create a new generation of crown corporations to uh, produce and deploy these at the requisite scale, uh, prioritize the supply chains as we need. But the third marker there is you gotta move from voluntary to mandatory. Right? Just like in the pandemic where the public was ahead of our politics saying, make it mandatory, right? Uh, let me give you another example out of the war. Pearl Harbor happens in December of 1941. In February of 1942, two months later, 
the last civilian automobile rolls off the assembly line in Detroit and for the next four years, their production and sale uh, is illegal in the USA. Now those factories were busy and those workers were busy pumping out other things. None of that happened because of the goodwill of the leadership of the big three automakers. It, 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 you know, at least one of them was a Nazi. Um, uh, it happened because they were ordered. They were mandated, they were required. But nothing that we've done on climate yet is mandatory. We, we encourage change, we incentivize change, we send price signals, we give rebates. What we have decidedly not done is require. So we have to set clear dates. And, and before I go to the q and I just wanna give people a little bit of perspective on that number you cited about 2 billion a year, I think you indicated in climate spending. There was an article in the Hill Times today in which a former senior official from military procurement, the military procurement office of the government of Canada estimated the life cycle costs of 50 naval frigates to be $286 billion. And we're spending $2 billion a year on an existential crisis. Uh, yeah, so, good, good perspective. So uh, let me go then to the Q and A. Uh, first uh, question is uh, from Mina Lee. Hi, Mina Lee. I know Mina Lee well. Uh, she, uh, she and I got to know each other during the leadership campaign last year uh, in the Green Party. She says, uh, I cringe every time I hear Justin Trudeau talk about the middle class, which is most of the time. Now the BC government is using the term for new housing, housing spending. And, and I, I, I myself have to you know, echo what Mina Lee is saying. The poor have almost disappeared entirely from political discourse in this country. It's always about the middle class. And of course, the middle class is under pressure. And it's right that the government should be concerned about people in the middle class. But how, what do you think about this constant emphasis in the middle class and the fact that we, there's almost no discussion, at least by those in power, of uh, the poor? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this, this was that my area for many years at the CCPA was actually not on climate. It was on inequality and poverty and welfare policy. Um, and this is why I say, like any great undertaking, um, it has to be compelling across the board. And, it, and this is why, why I like to point out what we actually brought in in the war in terms of income transfers. Um, we're asking people to take a big leap into an, the unknown where there's a lot of insecurity, employment insecurity, income insecurity. And we have to, we, we have to, we have to take that out of the equation. Um, mm -hmm with job guarantees and income support programs uh, uh, that let people take the leap. Thank you. Uh, next question uh, from uh, Carol Ann. Do you think, uh, I'm not, I think this is directed perhaps at both of us, but I'll let you go first. Do you think that a green NDP climate coalition for the next election might enable us to effectively address climate change given the liberal government's uh, uh, lack of action? So I got distracted looking at the questions as well. So the questions about the, the, the NDP Green um, Climate Coalition. Yes, I believe it is, uh, it may be 350.org or yeah. they're calling for yeah. an NDP Green Climate Coalition to deal with the climate emergency. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Seth? I mean, I'm supportive of that. I, uh, first of all, uh, to take a step back from the question, I have long, long been a strong advocate for proportional representation and electoral reform that would bring that about. I campaigned as hard as I could when these things have come, when those referendums came up in British Columbia, um, because I, I think our, our electoral system is a problem and it's one of the sources blocking progress. Um, and it forces people to vote strategically, not for what they want, but for against what they most don't want. Um, and, Efforts like 350's effort for a, a climate coalition, you know, speak to the fact that most of us are climate alarm nonpartisans. And we are trying to figure out how to make the best of a crappy electoral system um, to realize our hopes and fears and give expression to our hopes and fears. So am I optimistic that the leadership of the, the NDP or the Greens will accept this? No. Um, uh, do I think it's still a good idea uh, to posit this campaign, this idea? Yes. I think it high, it's, first of all, it's highlighting the fact that the Trudeau government isn't in emergency mode. It's highlighting the fact that I, I hope these two parties 
uh, don't waste time and resources campaigning against one another, because um, that makes me sad. Um, and maybe it'll play out in an interesting way at a local level. It's saying to people, find out who are the, who are the real climate champs in your riding? Who's a contender? Who can only ever hope to be a spoiler? And, and, and do your best to try to elect as many climate champions across a number of parties as we possibly can. Yeah, I, I agree with you on both counts. Uh, for the record, uh, I fully support the Alliance. Uh, I've been advocating on behalf of the one-time Alliance for Democratic Reform uh, with some frustration over the past several months because I'm not seeing much appetite at the leadership level of either party uh, for even a one-time Alliance. But hopefully we'll come to understand uh, that that is arguably the best path for the left to exercise real political power in this country, or at least more political power than it has up until now. Uh, another question from Evan. It seems the main difference between this crisis and the war was that the war was a more direct threat to the lives of wealthy Canadians. So we were able to mobilize through politicians, whereas the climate crisis isn't, and so it requires the people to mobilize and force politicians to act. Uh, what are some effective actions you would like to see uh, people take? Mm, there's sort of two questions there. Your first one's an interesting uh, theory, and it's possible, except um, I would point out that, again, a, a large chunk of the business class in Canada and an even bigger chunk of the business class in the United States did not initially support going to war. <laughs> um, you know, they didn't welcome the intervention in, in, in their affairs that in, war inevitably brings. Um, and it hadn't been that long since the First World War. Uh, they didn't like that uh, they knew it would it put limits on their profits. Um, so there was, there was in fact opposition. Um, and, and so it took work to get everyone on board, including many of them. Um, uh, uh, so in some cases there's a, there's a similarity, but maybe it's true that there's, there's, th there is this dynamic today where I think for some of the very wealthy, they just figure they'll be able to buy themselves protection in the face of the climate emergency. Right. And that's part of the erosion of social solidarity that we're confronting. But on this, on the back part of your question, um, what I'm saying is, uh, for far too long, the, you know, the discussions about what we do on climate have, and the solutions have been individualized. What, what are you individually going to do? Now, don't get me wrong, that's important. You know, change how you get around, fuel swap your home, do all of those things. Uh, I have. Um, but that's not the solution. Because um, if we're counting on people voluntarily doing those things, we're fried. Um, so this is an inherently political project now and a political moment of trying to do whatever we can and take whatever steps we can to get our political leadership and parties to switch into emergency mode and adopt that four markers framework that I'm offering up to you. Um, that's, that's what we gotta do. And the next question comes from Clark and it's um, a little bit of a dark question. Uh, and Clark asks, has 40 years of neoliberalism destroyed human virtue and accountability? Well, I'm glad this came up actually. So neoliberalism is one of the things that we're up against. Um, and it's related to the earlier discussion we had about the new climate denialism. Why are our governments uh, and, and really our leadership across the political spectrum, including Dimitri, I would say the Greens, why are they not in their platforms uh, spending what they should to win? Why are they not creating new economic institutions to get the job done? Why are they not just using the regulatory power of the state to require change? And I think the answer is because 40 years of neoliberalism have so constrained and straitjacketed what is considered allowable. Um, in some odd way, the pandemic sort of liberates that you know, it's laid bare what in fact is possible, particularly on the spending side. Um, but I think Clark's quite right in naming this. I think that the most insidious legacy of 40 years of neoliberalism isn't the spending cuts and the tax cuts and the deregulation and the privatization. It's the, and it's, it's Alex Himmelfarb again, who kind of presented it to me this way. 
It's the sapping of our imagination and our belief and our capacity to do grand things together. Um, that's what we most need to restore. And that is what I was trying to do in the exercise of the book. I was trying to excavate this historic reminder of the speed and scale of what we are capable of when we actually shift into emergency mode. I want to just add a few words about this, this notion about neoliberalism's effect on uh, virtue and accountability. I think that there has been a, a really a profound shift in public opinion in the West towards a more progressive and humane society. And the pandemic has accelerated that, but I think yes, we can trace the origins of that perhaps to the financial crisis uh, and the birth of the Occupy Wall Street movement. And although it was brutally crushed, by law enforcement authorities at the behest of politicians, uh, you know, within a year, it never really went away. The passion and the energy and the objectives of the movement didn't when it just morphed in, into other movements. Uh, so, for example, today we have the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, you know, the Idle No More movement came up along. There was a Leap uh, Manifesto, which you talk about in your book. Uh, so, uh, the pandemic is now, I think, really focused the public's attention on what the government is capable of doing for the benefit of the most vulnerable members of society when it is minded to use its immense power. And yes. uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful actually that we're going to emerge from this uh, terrible public health emergency as a much more humane society. And that public opinion is going to force our political leaders to act in a way they have not done in, in our lifetimes, or at least yeah. not, not, with it, not since the birth of neoliberalism. You know, Dimitri, I would phrase what you said off the bat there slightly differently. I actually think as someone who you know has spent over 20 years watching public opinion polling on these questions of our desire to care for one another and the planet um in the main our values have always been good um and, and i think you're right that if anything recent events have reinforced that the 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 insidious success of neoliberalism has not been to convince people that their values are wrong. It has been to convince people that their values aren't realistic or realizable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, uh, and I think you're right too, that the pandemic has blown some of that out of the water um, and shown what was possible all along. Yeah. So with that, unless we have one more question, Seth, let me just check. Um, I think we've addressed uh, the other questions up in, uh, in our prior commentary. So uh, it has been a, an absolute pleasure speaking with you this evening, Seth. I can't urge uh, those who've been with us this evening strongly enough to read Seth's book, uh, tell your friends about it. Uh, and of course, I'm going to give the closing uh, comments to you. Okay, well, I, uh, thanks Dimitri. And I was gonna say um, that uh, it wasn't part of the intro, but I actually have a new initiative out of the book called the Climate Emergency Unit. Uh, as a it's a five-year project uh, that I'm housing with the David Suzuki Institute, um, but uh, it's about to launch in the next few days, and uh, people can uh, go look look for it online. It's just going to be climateemergencyunit.ca, and uh, and uh, it's going to be trying to ramp up ambition uh, uh, in, around these these four markers in the in the coming years. Um, and I like to close that these days actually with one, you know, we, we were talking about the similarities between the climate emergency and the pandemic experience, but I want to highlight one important difference. Because um, people often say, oh, you know, look at the fatigue, the, the COVID fatigue that people are experiencing. And uh, that's, that's real. And, um, and people say, when they hear my thesis, you know, people, look how people are tired in less than a year of emergency measures. And now here I am asking people to go into emergency mode for a few years. But here's the difference. The things we were called upon to do in response to the pandemic are anathema to all of our social instincts. Stay home, isolate. And that is hard. Yeah. But the good news about the climate emergency is that it calls on us to do precisely the opposite, which is to go out and do something grand together. And we can do that for a few years. Well said. Thank you so much, Seth. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening and to the organizers uh, for putting together the, uh, this presentation of Seth's wonderful book. Thank you. And uh, best wishes to you all. Thanks.